Hi, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and in this video we're going to look at stability analysis using the Routh Array for a couple special cases. I'm going to call them special case 1 and 2. And for special case 1, what happens is we have a first column element is 0. And for special case 2, we have an entire row of the Routh Array is zero. In both cases, if that ever happens, in both of those cases, we know that the system is going to be unstable, that the characteristic equation will have poles outside of the left half plane. But depending on uh, further analysis of these two cases, we can determine how many poles are in the right half plane, uh, and sometimes if we have poles on the imaginary axis and what they are. So let's look at case one first. And we'll just do this by example. So let's say that we have some f of s, a characteristic equation, that looks like this. And we just start doing our Routh array. We put these two indices here for um, based on the highest power of s of that characteristic equation. And we get a one there. This would be all the odd terms. There is no zero, or there is no s squared term, so the next odd term is a negative three. We get a zero, and the next even term is a two. Beautiful. So now the s to the one first column element would be zero times negative three, which is zero, minus two over zero. That's a problem, because that quantity is undefined. Well, here's the fix. What we'll do is, is we'll replace the zero with epsilon, w slash I'm using for width. And then we just finish the Routh array. And then finally, for, to analyze the first column, we take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. Pretty straightforward process. So let's just finish off this example and do it. Again, we have this, and here's our Routh array again. Give myself a little extra room for those last two rows, because sometimes I have to do some calculations. There, and I've replaced that offending term with an epsilon. And now when I go ahead and do the Routh array, I get minus 3 epsilon minus 2 divided by epsilon. And I can pad this with zeros so that I get epsilon 0 times 0 divided by epsilon, who cares? So I'll just put a 0 there. And then this term, this one just comes down right into there. I can do it formally and say I have this term times 2 minus 0 divided by this term. That gives me 2. Okay, so here's my first column that I have to analyze, and I'm looking for sign changes. But to sort out what the sign is in that element, what I have to do is take the limit as epsilon goes to zero of minus three epsilon minus two over epsilon. So I have limit as epsilon goes to zero of minus three minus two over epsilon. And we'll just call that minus infinity. So my first row, if I rewrite this, would be like so. I have two sign changes. And so I know I have two right half plane poles. Now, you, you know, the, doing the limit is very satisfying and, and the proper way to do this, but in a pinch you can just say, well, I'll just let epsilon equal some small number and go through the math and you'll get the exact same result of course. Okay, so that's special case number one. Definitely unstable. It's just a matter of sorting out how many poles we have in the right half plane. Case two is a wee bit more interesting. Okay, this is the case where the entire row is zero. Again, the system is definitely unstable, but now there are some 
well, I'll, for lack of a better way to describe it, I'll say there's some physical significance of what's happening. When that entire row is all zero, you have just a, a handful of possibilities. Either this case is happening with a couple poles, and these are equidistant from the uh, imaginary axis, or this case, you have a couple poles on the imaginary axis. Again, this is real and imaginary. Or you have a case like this, where you have poles that are symmetric about the imaginary axis in the, in the, in the complex plane, and they are complex. Now, to actually go through all the analysis for this special case, we need one more bit of information. So I'll create a definition of the auxiliary equation. And we'll denote it as A of S. A of S is a pretty cool thing. What it is, is it's um, the polynomial that, that can be you know, reconstituted, for lack of a better word, reconstructed if you'd like, reconstituted from the row above the row of all zeros. Okay, we'll see an example of that in just a jiffy. The interesting thing about it is that, well this is only mildly interesting, it's always even. Okay, that's, that's great. But the more interesting thing is that its roots, so I'll say the roots of A are also roots of F, the characteristic equation. And of course, A is going to be lower dimension in general than F. So if I have this case happen, I can extract out the auxiliary equation and maybe even solve for its roots. And so not only will I know how many poles I have in the right half plane or on the imaginary axis, I'll actually know what they are. That's a pretty exciting thing. So here's an example. Let's say that we extract out a characteristic equation and it looks like this. Kind of a big thing. And we want to analyze its stability, and even more so, we want to understand how many poles are in the right half plane, maybe on the on the imaginary axis, etc. So we start with s to the sixth, and I keep going. Great. Let me start filling these in: one, negative two, negative seven, negative four. That's all my even coefficients. One. Uh, negative 3, negative 4, and 0 for my odd coefficients. So for this, for the s the fourth element, I'll get a negative 2 times 1, so a negative 2, minus negative 3, or plus 3, divided by 1. And I'll sneak it in right here and circle it, so I have a 1 there. For this element here, I'll have a negative 7, uh, minus negative 4, divided by 1. So negative 7 minus negative 4, so that gives negative 3, and I'll circle that. And then for this element, I'll have negative 4 minus 0 over 1, which is just minus 4. And I get a 0 there. Now notice one thing is that the s of the fourth row is exactly the same as the s of the fifth row. Whenever that happens, the next row is going to be all zeros. And we can see that quickly by looking at 1 times negative 3 times or minus negative 3. So we get we get 0. 1 times negative 4 minus negative 4. 0. 0. 0. So here's our row of all zeros. And from that, I'm not going to fill this in just now, but from that I can extract the auxiliary equation from this row. It's always even. And we started off by this. We get s to the fourth, minus 3s squared, minus 4. The roots of that auxiliary equation are also roots of f of s. 
Now here's the fix. First thing we do is we form DDS of that auxiliary equation. For our case that will be 4s cubed minus 6s. And then we put that into the row of all zeros. Oops, not thetas. Zeros. And then you just keep going with the Routh array analysis. So here I've gone ahead and filled in the first few rows of the Routh array so that you wouldn't have to watch me do that. And of course, right here, I put in the DDS of the auxiliary equation. So then we just go ahead and fill in the rest of the Routh array. So if you go through and do it in the normal fashion, you'd get a negative 3 halves there from 4 times negative 3, so that's uh, negative 12, plus 6 divided by 4. And then you have uh, 4 times negative 4, so that's negative 16, minus 0 over 4, so I get a negative 4. And now for this row, I take this times that, minus those two, divided by this. And that'll give me a negative 50 thirds. I'll get a 0, 0, 0. And finally, for the last element, this term makes its way all the way down to the bottom. We can calculate that by taking this, multiplying it by here, minus 0, divided by this. So I get negative 4. So now we analyze this column, and we see that there is exactly one sign change that tells us that we have one right half plane pole. What it doesn't tell us is anything about poles on the imaginary axis, but we might be able to sort that out by looking at the auxiliary equation, which was s to the fourth minus 3s squared minus 4. So let's go ahead and get a clean sheet and play around with that a bit. I could set that equal to zero just to remind myself that what I'm trying to do is find the roots of that equation. And these are also roots of the characteristic equation f of s. So what I'll do is I'll let uh, z, I'll define a new variable z called s squared, write this as z squared minus 3z minus 4, and then go ahead and get the two roots, z1, z2. So let's see, I'll have this over 2, so I have 3 halves plus minus 5 halves. So z1 and z2 are 4 and negative 1, which means that s squared is equal to 4, which says I have a couple roots, s1 and 2, let's call them, at plus minus 2. So now I can actually see the pole that I have in the right half plane, it is the s equal plus 2 pole. So not only do I know it's in the right half plane, but now I know its value. The other one I get is s squared equals negative 1, which says I have a couple more roots or poles that I can solve for, and that's a plus minus j. So from all of this, I now know quite a bit about the poles of that transfer function. In the complex plane, the real and imaginary axes, I have a pole at plus minus 2, and I also have poles at plus minus j. Now since I know that there's only one pole in the right half plane, and I've now solved all the poles from the um, auxiliary equation, I now know that the remaining two poles because it was a sixth order characteristic equation, are somewhere in here, in the left half plane. Okay, so let's just recap. We looked at uh, a couple different special cases of the Routh array. The first one is where one of the elements of the first column is zero, and the other one is where the entire row is zero. In both cases, we know that that 
a characteristic equation is going to have roots in the right half plane. So let's just recap. We looked at two different special cases of the Routh array. The first one is where there is one element that is in the first column and is zero. And the second case is where an entire row of the Routh array is zero. In both cases, we know the system will be unstable. We know that there will be poles outside of the left half plane. And then we had a couple different fixes to analyze those cases further to determine how many poles are not in the left half plane and be able to determine if there are poles on the imaginary axis by introducing this notion of the auxiliary equation and solving it. So again, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and thanks for watching.